forward to the passage of this legislation with this amendment. And again, I appreciate the work of the Senator from Maine and others on this. I yield back my time. Madam President. The Senator from Maine. Madam President, I rise to commend the Senator from Ohio for bringing forth this very worthwhile initiative, which the Senate passed without dissent uh, just about an hour or so ago. Uh, his amendment is a very important amendment. What it simply says is that if an organization is exempt from ENDA for religious reasons, then government cannot turn around and somehow retaliate against this employer based on his claiming or her claiming a legitimate religious exemption as provided by ENDA. And that means that if the business or organization is entitled to compete for certain grants or contracts from the federal, state, or local government, that there cannot be this subtle discrimination against the employer for claiming the religious exemption legitimately conferred upon the business under ENDA. And I think that's really important. We don't want retaliation or discrimination or unfair treatment on either side. And I really commend Senator Portman for coming forward with this amendment. I believe that it's consistent with the bill and that it strengthens the bill. So I want to congratulate him for his initiative. And it's been a pleasure to work with him, Senator Ayotte, and other members of the Senate in support of this initiative. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President. The Senator from New Hampshire. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, today I rise to talk about the impact that Obamacare is having on the people of my state, the state of New Hampshire. It's been over a month since the health care exchanges have opened, and in that short time, we've already seen so many problems with Obamacare. Frankly, it's a mess. The failure of healthcare.gov is something that has revealed deeply troubling incompetence in terms of implementing a website that people can use and have access to and is secure and protects their private information. And frankly, we're in a position where really the website is merely the canary in the coal mine. The flaws in this law are much deeper than the website. Even former supporters of Obamacare are telling me that it's not working. I'm hearing from my constituents about this, and frankly, I feel very badly for them in, because so much of what's happening to them is as a result of how the law is drafted and concerns that were brought forward years ago at this point. For example, I've heard from Marianne in Lisbon, New Hampshire, and she said, we had hoped this would be a solution but instead it will be more of a financial drain. The American people are the ones who are paying the price right now. They're getting cancellation notices, they're seeing their premiums go up, and they're losing their doctors. Workers are suffering. Many of them have seen their hours cut to 29 hours because of an arbitrary mandate defining full-time workers as those who work 30 hours a week. Others are fearful that they'll lose their employer-sponsored coverage altogether, and business owners remain reluctant to expand, worried that they'll trigger the looming penalties from Obamacare. Most tragically, we now know that the law was sold to the American people under false pretenses. The President said, if you like your insurance plan, you keep it. In fact, yesterday we checked the website uh, for the White House, and that claim is still on there. I'm hearing every day 
from New Hampshire residents who are telling me that they're seeing their health insurance policies canceled. In fact, in the newspaper this morning, I picked it up, and the headline in New Hampshire announced that 22,000 individuals will see coverage canceled at the end of the year. Here's what Granite Staters have been writing me and saying to me. And I want to share their concerns with the entire country because I know this isn't just happening to people in New Hampshire, but these are the real people who are being affected by Obamacare. Lynn in Greenland wrote me, the president was wrong. I can't keep my coverage if I like it, and I can't keep my preferred hospital, and his plans are the ones that are subpar. It's bringing me to tears on a daily basis. Please help. Edward and Marlo is self-employed. I feel so badly when I receive letters like this. He has a rare disease and a high deductible plan. He wrote, I received a notice from Anthem last week that they will be canceling this policy. Is that what President Obama meant when he said that no one who currently has their own policy and likes it will lose it? I am devastated that I will now have to go out and secure another policy somewhere which could cost me significantly more. Jennifer and Canaan wrote, I received a letter from Anthem Blue Cross stating that my current health insurance plan was being discontinued because it did not conform to the law under the Affordable Care Act. In other words, the plan I was promised I could keep was made illegal by Washington politicians. Michael and Atkinson said, Kelly, we have been told this would expand options. The fact is we are now being told what we can and what we cannot do and where we can go. To say that I am upset would not begin to describe how I feel. Richard in Alton Bay said, I'm a small business owner in New Hampshire and have been with my health insurance provider for over 10 years. I was recently informed that the policy I have had for all of these years and I like quite a bit, will be canceled due to provisions in Obamacare. When I contacted the company, they said they are planning to transition me into a plan that costs more and offers substantially less benefits and protections than my original plan. I am outraged by this. Jamie and Littleton wrote me, Today we received a letter from Anthem Blue Cross stating my husband's individual health care plan, which he's had for 15 years, will be changing to conform to ACA laws and will no longer be in effect come September 1st, 2014. Lewis in Sunapee wrote me, what just happened? I received a cancellation notice from my insurance company and the coverage I am eligible for is more expensive. Help me. President Obama has made the promise that if you like your doctor, you will be able to keep your doctor, period. For those who are seeing their plans canceled, we know that that's simply not the case. But there's another issue that New Hampshire is facing, and that's a matter of choice and keeping the not only the doctor that you want to keep, but also going to the hospital that you want to go to. Because in New Hampshire, there's only one insurer who's going to participate on the exchanges at this point. And to keep costs down, the insurer has decided to limit its network. So 10 of our 26 hospitals are not part of the exchange and are excluded. So, for example, the capital of New Hampshire is Concord. One of the hospitals that's been excluded is Concord Hospital. I worked in Concord for years. To think that the Concord Hospital is going to be excluded and all the people in that area that rely on that hospital have had their children there, have all done all kinds of things, and have had treatment there, that 
they would be excluded if they're now on the exchanges, that they can't go to the Concord Hospital. This is a real impact on people in their lives, and I feel very badly for my constituents. A doctor in Peterborough wrote me. He was once a supporter of Obamacare. He described the consequences simply. In a letter to me, he said that his patients have one of three terrible options right now. And that's because uh, the hospital in his area has been excluded from the exchange. First, they can switch doctors and drive considerable distance to a hospital that Anthem does include in the exchange. Two, they can purchase insurance outside of the exchange at considerably higher rates than they could this year. Or three, they can stick with their current doctor, risk having no insurance, and pay the government a penalty for being uninsured. With his hospi hospital that he's associated with excluded from the exchange, he said it's the less affordable care act for his patients. And this doctor gave me a troubling practical effect of what his hospital being left out would mean for his patients. He used this example. Consider the pregnant woman who has delivered all of her current children at our hospital. She's now expecting in February. She must now either drive our twisty New England roads in the dead of winter to a hospital 55 minutes from her home to deliver her baby or pay considerably higher insurance premiums to stay where she is comfortable and safe. He's one of numerous citizens across New Hampshire who has expressed similar concerns about local hospitals being excluded from the exchange. I want to share with you some of the other concerns that have been written from my constituents. Vicki and Seabrook wrote, the list of doctors and medical facilities that will take my insurance is limited and my Massachusetts doctors are not on the list. The one closest to me, Portsmouth Hospital, is not on the list. Kathleen in Newcastle wrote, the exchange choice will not allow me to use my docs, including primary care, who is affiliated with the Portsmouth Hospital. All oncology physicians are located in Boston, not covered. Margaret in Stratford wrote me, she currently goes to Frisbee Memorial hospital in Rochester, which is again not part of the exchange. She described the impact to me in this way. I would no longer be able to go to Frisbee Memorial Hospital, which is four miles away. I could no longer see the gynecologist whom I trust. I could no longer use the surgeon who saved my life when emergency surgery was required. I could no longer visit the same internist. If I were to develop heart problems, I could no longer go to Portsmouth Regional Hospital. Gregory in Rochester said that his primary care physician is at Frisbee. He said that means he'll have to go to another hospital. And what he told me, he said, I don't know and, and does not know my health condition. Robert in Stratford said, he's gone to Frisbee for 40 years. He wrote, I've had multiple different insurance companies, but have always been able to keep the same doctors. Now, because of Obamacare, Frisbee is out of the loop. This is totally unfair to all the people who live in the area. What gives? Teresa in Peterborough wrote me, she said that none of her current physicians, including her primary care physician and her OBGYN are in the exchange. She wrote, the nearest providers in this network are 45 minutes west, 60 minutes east, or 90 minutes north. This will be very costly to me in terms of time taken off to attend appointments at these distant offices or hospitals and since I'm self-employed, a day off to go to the doctor is one day without income. A single mother, also from Peterborough, 
wrote me and said, if my 17-year-old son does get sick this winter, I will be required to take a minimum of a half a day off to bring my son to Keene or Manchester to find a primary care physician who will accept insurance through affordable care. Not that I can even afford that route. I'm also hearing heart-wrenching stories from New Hampshire citizens about how their premiums are going up. As you know, the law, when this law was being sold, it was sold that premiums would go down, but that's not what I'm hearing from my constituents. Christopher and Ringe wrote, my insurance is going to double on January 1st of 2014. Even the options that conform to the Health Act are double the amount I am paying today. It doesn't make my insurance would go up by double when this is called affordable health care. Rick and Pembroke wrote, last year the sum total of my family's health care costs was $2,300. I've been looking at, the health insur at health insurance for my family. The lowest insurance will cost $566.40 per month. The family deductible will be $11,500. Even if I spend the same as last year on actual health care, I will have to pay an additional $6,800. This isn't fair and it isn't affordable. I don't know how many people who can budget for an additional $6,800 a year. Brendan and Sam Morton said, I'm self-employed and my wife and I pay for our health insurance through Anthem that provides coverage for us and our 15-month-old daughter. Presently, we pay about $580 per month for a major deductible plan with a total family deductible of $7,500. A couple of weeks ago, we received a letter from Anthem informing us that our old policies don't meet the requirements of the new ACA, and therefore, we were going to be canceled. When researching new options on Anthem's website, we found that our deductible was now going to be $1,200, excuse me, $12,000 per year and at an increased cost of about $150 per month. We feel as though the country has been misled about being able to keep their current coverage. Holly in Charleston wrote me, I buy an individual policy to cover myself, but my policy went up 25% on October 1st, and one of the reasons stated in the letter I received from Blue Cross was to cover the implementation of ACA. As a result, I dropped down to a less expensive plan, and guess what? I got a letter telling me I was okay until 2014, when that plan will no longer be available because it doesn't comply with the new rules and regs. I heard from Patty in New Ipswich, and she said that after her insurance company told her to find a plan, she signed up for at least, for the least expensive bronze plan, bronze plan available. She said, still not only will my premium be $75 a month higher, for a total of just under $600 per month for me. But in addition to that, I have a $5,400 annual deductible. Also, the prescription plan that Mr. Obama and Mrs. Pelosi mandated also has a $5,400 deductible. So effectively, that is not a prescription plan at all. In fact, this plan is basically a very expensive catastrophic plan and nothing more. It is not affordable, and I'm disgusted. Barbara in Merrimack wrote me, and her husband, she and her husband don't yet qualify for Medicare. Their existing plan is being phased out, so she checked, checked the exchange 
and she wrote, the product that was closest to what we currently have is silver and is just too expensive. The cheapest coverage we could find is in the bronze category and will cost $1,228.32 per month and will have a deductive deductible of $5,950 per individual and a deductible of $11,900 per family. That means that all basic services and medications will be out of pocket. Medications will be covered at 40% of the copay. $1,228.32 equals $14,739.84 per year and is more than my mortgage. Unlike the government, I can't raise my debt ceiling. Anita and Sutton wrote, what was supposed to help people like my husband and I who are self-employed and he has a chronic illness only hurts us. Our premiums went up $2,287.70 per month and this is now with a $4,000 single, $8,000 family deductible, nothing like a 30% increase for one year. Having to hoist yourself up each day and go to work and try to carry on is hard enough with this chronic illness. Now we have to pick and choose what bills we can afford to pay. Jane and Troy said she tried to enroll her son into the federal program. And this is what she wrote to me. The quote was $600 a month. Do you know of any 20-year-old who can afford $600 a month? Tim and Merrimack wrote me, contrary to the original intent of the Affordable Care Act, individuals who obtain insurance on their own are paying radically escalating costs based on individual coverage for a healthy, non-smoking 51-year-old male available for January 1st of 2014 on the health care exchange in New Hampshire. The results are the follow as following. Premium, 25% increase from 4,200 to 5,300. Deductible, 20% increase from 5,000 to 6,000. An 82% increase in less than two years, 2,900 in June of 2012 to 5,300 in January of 2014. Then I heard from Eric in Hancock. He said that he has seen a 46% premium hike. He wrote to me, what has been done to our health care system? This is the Unaffordable Care Act. In some cases, the cost of insurance is rising because plans must include coverage for services that consumers don't want based on their individual situation or don't need based on their individual situation. For example, Jeff in Hudson says that his premiums will go up nearly 40% because of Obamacare. He said it seems that some of the cost drivers are for coverages which my wife and I do not need or want, but are required to have due to law. For instance, we must have maternity coverage even though we do not plan on having more children. We're in our early 50s. We must have pediatric dental insurance, even though we have no children under the age of 18. Doug in Bedford wrote me, the maternity issue is a trap for seniors. Carolyn Newport wrote, can anyone please explain to me why at 60 years of age, I need an insurance plan that requires maternity provisions? Can anyone explain to me why I would be required to pay for pediatric standalone dental when I have no children? Since this is mandated by the government, why would I have to pay an insurer fee, exchange fee, and reinsurance fee? She said the most affordable plan that she's seen has been $504.15 a month, which she can't afford, and a $6,350 out-of-pocket premium. Carol asks, if I cannot afford the premium, how can I afford the deductible? 
and others that I have heard from are worried that their employers will drop their coverage, finding it cheaper to pay the fine than to provide coverage for their workers. Benjamin in Greenville wrote, my portion currently about $5,000 a year will jump to $20,000 per year to maintain my current coverage. I make, quote, too much money to be subsidized. Tell me, Senator, where do I find $15,000 a year, $1,250 a month, $288 a week in my already tight budget? He wrote me, no more vacations, no more dance lessons for my kids, no more family date night once a month, no more Christmas presents. Another theme that I've heard in the letters that I've received from my constituents is the feeling that those in the middle are being squeezed the most. Donna in Newport wrote, my employer is now canceling the company-sponsored health plan as of two, January 2014, which cost me $2,288 per year. In shopping for a new plan, I am seeing the possibility of a $22 subsidy to help me with a monthly cost of $400. An increase in my health care costs I cannot afford. I am in the middle class, a tax-paying and proud American that did not ask for this act and now suffering because of it. Cheryl and Ackworth wrote, not only do I have to pay twice the premium, but it will be post-tax a double hit. If I was poor, I would be okay, or if I worked for a large employer, I, I would be okay. But for those of us trying to make a good living and be responsible, productive citizens, we end up carrying this. This is not the American dream at all. Joseph in Salem wrote to me, on September 30th, I received a letter from Anthem informing me that my new payment to keep my current plan, which I've had for over eight years will increase $212.47 on January 1st. That is a $2,548.80 increase for 2014. This is what Obamacare is doing to the middle class. And Roberta in Nashua is like many of my constituents pleading for help. She wrote, please hear my plea and see what you can do to allow people like me and my husband to keep our care and not be forced into purchasing exchange insurance, which is so costly and will be a financial hardship for us. It is not affordable. In addition to canceled policies, patients losing their doctors and higher premiums, I've also heard about another aspect and consequence of Obamacare from people who are working hard, uh, trying to make ends meet, and those are workers that are seeing their hours cut. Under the law, employers must provide coverage for employees who work 30 hours or more per week. Many of these employers, not surprisingly, have decided to reduce hours rather than comply with this, with this new mandate. So this is what my constituents are writing me about, these hardworking people trying to make a living. I heard from an EMT from the Monadnock region who wrote to me and said, my employer notified the 75 of us who work there that effective January 1st, our hours will be cut due to Obamacare. So our incomes will drop and make it harder for us to buy our own insurance. An educator from the Upper Valley wrote, our school district and surrounding ones are cutting back paraprofessional jobs to 29 hours. Many of these people were full-time. Instead, they hired several part-time people to cover the once full-time positions. Now they are no longer entitled to any benefits. Many of these individuals have worked 15 or more years with a school district as full-timers. 
I've heard from business owners as well. They've told me that the looming mandates in the, in the law are causing them to think about eliminating coverage for their employers, excuse me, for their employees, even though they don't want to do it. They want to do what's right for their employees. Stephen in Nashua wrote me, I'm a small employer. I would be very tempted to dump my plan for my employees, give them a few extra dollars, and just get out of the healthcare business. And I've also heard time and time and again about how looming penalties under Obamacare are causing businesses to think twice about growing and adding new workers. I heard from Matt on the seacoast. He wrote to me and said, on a business level, I don't know if I will expand because I would not be able to pay the penalties or the health insurance for my staff members. Madam President, these are just some of the stories that I'm receiving from New Hampshire about hardships that Obamacare is causing for people who are working hard, who want to make ends meet, who want to keep the health plans that they have now. And I feel terribly bad for these people. It breaks my heart. I have worked hard. I've sponsored many efforts and voted to repeal this law. I've called repeatedly over the last several days for a time out from Obamacare. We do need a time out, Madam President, because of the concerns I just talked about in this chamber that I'm hearing from my constituents and I know that many members in this chamber are hearing. We need the President to call a timeout. Now, I came to the floor several times during the government shutdown, and I said it was wrong to shut down the government to try to defund Obamacare because of the harmful impact of a government shutdown. I even took the step of calling on members of my own party, please don't go forward and shut the government down. Now it's time for the President to see the impact of this law and understand from someone who in some instances has stood up to her own party on the government shutdown, I'm asking the President of the United States to hear from the people of this country that are being impacted negatively by the health care law and say, call a time out, Mr. President, it's not working. They're having difficulties with the website. They're worried that their personal information won't be protected on the website. But as I talked about today, the problems are much deeper with people receiving cancellation notices, with people receiving premium hikes that they cannot afford, with hours being cut for workers who want to work and make a living in this great country. I would ask the President to call a timeout to bring people together. This law was passed out of this chamber on party lines. I would argue that the best way to address health care in this country and to address real concerns I know people had with the status quo as well is to bring a bipartisan group together because what we are seeing now is not working. My constituents have also taken the time to point out to me, in addition to the major problems that they see with Obamacare, they've shared a few ideas with me as well about how they, where, we think, where they think we should go from here instead of Obamacare, and I want to share those as well. Many of them agreed that competition in New Hampshire is effectively non-existent. Let's face it, we have one insurer on the exchange. One suggestion I saw, and it's one I agree with, is to allow for the purchase of insurance across state lines. Why shouldn't insurance companies have to compete on a national basis? I also agreed with a constituent who said that we need to place our focus where it belongs, crafting legislation that reduces health care costs rather than trying to create an artificial health insurance marketplace. Another constituent wisely pointed out 
that there shouldn't be a cookie cutter set of policies such as the ones that result in seniors purchasing coverage that includes maternity care. Instead, people should be able to shop for coverage that suits their particular needs. And we, sh we should respect that different people have different needs in healthcare. There are many other ideas that I know we could work on together. These are just some of the ones that my constituents have written, and I know they've written me other great ideas as well. Finally, an overarching theme I've heard is that Americans are tired of being victims of partisan gamesmanship, and I agree with them. We've had too much partisan gamesmanship on so many issues in the Congress. They're tired of the politics. They want us to work together to solve tough problems, and I agree with them on that. On behalf of the people of New Hampshire, I renew my call for a timeout on Obamacare. Let's have both parties come to the table and find health care solutions that work for the American people. Thank you, Madam President. I yield the floor. I note the absence of a quorum, Madam President. The clerk will call the roll. Thank you. Mr. Alexander. The Senate back in a quorum call. We're waiting for a senator to come to the floor. The Senate today live on C-SPAN 2. We expect a formal debate to get underway on ENDA, the Employment Non-Discrimination Act. That bill would ban employers from using sexual identity or gender orientation in hiring, promotion, and firing decisions. Several amendments are expected to be offered, including ones related to protections for religious employers. We've heard a number of senators uh, speaking about uh, the end of legislation today. Votes may happen during today's session on amendments, and uh, we expect final passage vote later this week. Uh, also on Capitol Hill today, the uh, Senate Finance Committee heard from Health and Human Services Secretary Kathleen Sebelius on the rollout of the nation's health care law and problems with the healthcare.gov website. That hearing will re-air tonight at 8 Eastern on C-SPAN. Also coming up uh, still this afternoon live on C-SPAN at 2.30 Eastern, the uh, Senate Homeland Security, uh, a subcommittee of the Senate Homeland Security Committee examines Hurricane Sandy recovery efforts. Again, that uh, this afternoon, 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time, live on C-SPAN. Here on C-SPAN 2, we're live with the Senate in a quorum call waiting for a member to come to the floor.
President, I would like to ask that the quorum call be suspended. Without objection. Madam President, I have nine unanimous consent requests for committees to meet during today's session of the Senate. They have the approval of both the majority and minority leaders. I ask unanimous consent that these requests be agreed to and that these requests be printed in the record. Without objection. Madam President, I rise today to speak uh, in the midst of our budget conference about a topic that has consumed a lot of time here in this chamber in the last number of months, and that is the effect of sequestration on the national economy, and in particular, the effect that sequestration is having on defense. Uh, this was the subject of my first speech, my maiden speech as a senator on the 27th of February, uh, talking about the particular effect of defense sequestration cuts on Virginia and the nation as a whole. And I return to it today, not just to be repetitive, but because we now finally are at the table in a budget conference, and as you know, I think this conference gives us an excellent opportunity to find a better path forward for the nation. Sequestration, which went into effect in early March, has caused major damage to our economy and the capacities of our Defense Department. Our Defense Department is the most capable fighting force the world's ever seen, and it's vital to our security, and Virginians and citizens of Wisconsin and every other state understand that. Sequestration was designed to be so painful that it would force Democrats and Republicans to find an alternative. We know that did not happen, and so the pain that was never intended to, to come into effect has been in effect, and we've seen the impact it's had on our economy since early March. Fortunately, while we did not compromise in order to avert sequester, there is still time to compromise. Now, when we're doing the hard work of a budget conference for the first time in five years, when we're doing the hard work of a budget conference in a divided Congress for the first time since 1986, it's, a t it's, it's now the time to address these damaging cuts. Let me talk for a second about the effect these cuts have on first Virginia, but then on our national defense and, and preparedness. Our nation's defense department has been strung along prior to sequestration for a number of years, three years, with continuing resolutions. The, you, you know, the, the, that's, that's jargon that we understand here, but for, for regular folks, it's as if you're into the next year in your household and you're told, well, we can't make a decision, so we'll just spend this year exactly what we spent last year. Well, wait a minute. We had a child in college last year who's not in college this year. Well, still, you've got to put money into tuition. Well, what about a new need that we have this year that we didn't have last year? Well, you can't do it. You're, you're limited to only what you did last year. That's what continuing resolution for three years in a row has done to defense, with the exception of some anomalies that are passed. It's required to defense to spend on the, the same line items and not, for example, invest more in important priorities. Madam President, the one I always think of is, is cybersecurity. If you do continuing resolutions and you just spend what you spent a few years ago, well, we know we have a bigger need for cybersecurity than we had a few years ago. There's attacks every day. No one thinks that the, the need to be diligent about cybersecurity is just constant. No, we ought to be spending more. Instead, continuing resolution requires our defense and other departments to just spend it yesterday's line items or three year ago line items that don't make much sense. In hearing after hearing in our budget uh, committee and the Armed Services Committee and others, our nation's uniformed and civilian military leaders have emphasized the damage sequestration is having on our military. And in every meeting with generals, admirals, Pentagon officials, I'm struck by their call to us as Democrats, Republicans, as Senate and House members to end this foolish policy. The next hearing we'll have is tomorrow in the Armed Services Committee when we'll be hearing again about the effects that sequestration is having on military readiness. Just, just in Virginia, just to pick one state, uh, my home state has been hit very hard. In fact, harder than any other state due to the large federal workforce 
and many military bases. And, and when you add to sequestration, sequestration and CR, the effect of the shutdown that we saw in September, uh, in October, the first two weeks of October, Virginians really feel it. Uh, today, a total of 177,982 Virginians are employed um, because of federal funding, either directly with the DOD or one of the service branches or through military contracts. For example, the talented men and women at the Newport News Shipyard, they're private contractors, uh, but they manufacture the largest items that are manufactured on planet Earth, nuclear aircraft carriers, and they do it to keep American men and women safe. This summer, over 70,000 DOD civilians in Virginia were furloughed. Construction training and maintenance on military bases was delayed, which affected private contractors. If sequester continues, as some are saying, some are fatalistic about it, as if, well, now we can't do anything about it. If sequester continues into 2014, 34 planned ship maintenance availabilities will be canceled in the new year. Each of these maintenance projects is massive and employs so many people. And as many of 19 of these are on the East Coast, 34 is the national figure, 19 of these are on the East Coast, including Virginia. This will hurt the ship repair industry in Hampton Roads and could lead to a loss of about 8,000 jobs nationally in the ship repair industry. Not only have these cuts Re, um, flowing from sequestration affected my state's economy, but uh, probably more to the point for all of us in this body, uh, we ought to be concerned because they're affecting our national security and they're degrading the capability of our military to deal with challenges. Madam President, I wish I could say that, you know, since I swore in as a senator with you on January 3rd, that the world has become a lot safer and more peaceful and, and, and less complicated, but to the contrary, in the 10 months we've been here, sadly, We've seen more instances of danger, more things to be concerned about, more problems that we have to deal with. We are not in a static situation. We're shrinking our budget at the same time as the degree of challenges we have around the world are, are growing more dangerous. Just this year, the sequestration cuts that went into effect in March have grounded one-third of our U.S. combat aircraft. You think about our Air Force and how important it is in, in today's uh, defense and, and planning for warfare. One third of our combat aircraft are grounded just because of sequestration, hampering our ability to respond to global crises and maintain strategic advantages. If sequestration goes forward, that one third will grow. The Air Force will be forced to cut uh, an additional by as much as 15 percent. That would suggest that nearly 50 percent of America's combat aircraft will be grounded in 2014 due to sequestration. We've got to ask ourselves, how can we not have an Air Force ready to respond to crises at a moment's notice? Moving to the Navy, our naval capabilities have also been significantly curtailed, reducing our normal levels of three carrier groups and three amphibious groups ready to respond to crisis within one week to only one of each. So again, a two-thirds reduction in the availability of carrier forces or amphibious vehicle forces to, that, that can meet that one-week response time in the event of emergency. Again, we've got to have a Navy that's ready to respond when there are crises. And then moving to the Army, uh, this year, because of the first year of sequestration, and it gets worse, the Army canceled all, all combat training center rotations for any non-deploying unit. So if a unit is being deployed, they're being trained, um, but then other units that don't have a regular assigned deployment, um, they stay trained as well to meet an emergency need. You know, if, if we know we're going to be deploying a unit to Afghanistan to replace another unit that, that's coming back, then we will train that unit. But you do some training for the units you're not planning to deploy just so that they're ready if the need exists. But we have canceled all of the training for non-deploying units, and General Odierno has said that 85% of America's brigade combat teams cannot meet the current training requirements that are set in our defense strategy. And, uh, President, we've asked what that means when folks come before us ask, well, what does it mean you're not getting the training? Does it mean you won't go if there's a compelling security need or national emergency? And they say, no, of course we'll go. If the Commander-in-Chief or Congress were to say we have to go, we'll go. But what training means is we'll go, but we'll suffer more casualties. You know, what training does is give us the edge to succeed. The absence of training means that we, and, and it's almost immoral to think about it, we have a training standard, but if you put people in harm's way who haven't been able to meet that training standard, you almost guarantee that the casualties will be more significant.
And that's not something that any of us can, can comfortably look in the mirror and tolerate. So it's not hard to see that what was promised about sequestration is in fact too, true. Sequestration is not strategic. Uh, it was never designed to be strategic. It wasn't designed to be you know, the careful cutting of costs that you might do, that you, that you should do, that every organization should do. And it's not only not strategic, it's not sustainable in the out years. The House Armed Services Committee, Republican House, Republican majority, many Republicans have admitted, quote, that sequestration of discretionary accounts was never intended to be policy. And our colleagues in the House, in a bipartisan way, have called for a lifting of sequestration in terms of its effects on defense. And our Armed Services Committee in the Senate, the SASC, also in the NDAA that we're about to debate on the Senate floor reached the same conclusion. Madam President, we were sitting in a markup of the NDAA bill, and I noticed at the time as a SASC member that there was nothing in the bill about sequestration. And all of our hearings virtually had touched on sequestration, so I put an amendment on the table, kind of on the fly. Let's just say sequestration is bad, and, and we should get rid of it. And we debated it right there as we were marking up the bill. And I, I recall that the vote on the amendment was 23 to 3, overwhelmingly in a voice vote. Uh, the Armed Services Committee, Democratic and Republican, were willing to embrace the proposition that sequestration was bad. And actually, the language was, not only is it bad for the DOD accounts, it's also bad for the other accounts as well. That's why I am calling in connection with our meeting as budget conferees for a sensible bipartisan approach to limit the negative impacts of sequestration. General Dempsey uh, was, was talking to a group of senators yesterday on the readiness subcommittee, and he said, what, what we need uh, to, to, to deal with in sequestration is money, time, and flexibility. The cuts are too steep, they're too front-loaded in terms of the timing, and there's too little flexibility for our military command to be able to use the dollars to do the right thing to keep us safe. And so we have to find a way to get out of the sequestration dead end um, and, and restore some of the cuts and provide both the timing and flexibility to make the, the management of them easier. If we reverse sequestration in this budget conference, that will create, by economists' estimates, 900,000 jobs at a time when our economy needs to get stronger and our unemployment rate needs to be dropped. And it will add a whole percentage point to our gross domestic product, according to the Congressional Budget Office. So now as the Budget Conference Committee uh, is meeting, and our next meeting is, is next week, and I, I felt, Madam President, that our opening meeting was a positive one, and, and it was mostly positive because as we went around the table, House members and Senate, Democrat and Republican, there was an absence of what I would call the non-negotiable language. You know, I, I listen carefully being new. I don't necessarily know all the details, but I know when I hear lines in the sand being drawn, you know, we, we won't do this, we won't do that. And when you hear that, you know that the negotiation is be very difficult. Well, I applaud the 29 conferees for having that opening meeting and not putting a lot of non-negotiable language out on the table. When we meet next week, I hope that attitude continues because we need colleagues from both sides of the aisle and both the House and Senate to work toward a positive solution in this conference that will do a number of things help us grow the economy, help us deal with the debt in a responsible way, not an irresponsible way, but lift the effects of sequestration so that we can be confident uh, that we will be safe as a nation. I pointed out uh, in conclusion, uh, Madam President, during the budget conference that while the, the House budget under the leadership of Chairman Ryan and the Senate budget under the leadership of, of Chairwoman Murray are different in a lot of ways, in other ways, you could step back from them and say the differences are not so mammoth that they can't be resolved. They're the kinds of differences that, that legislative bodies around the country, state legislatures, often resolve. The, the top line difference between the House and Senate budgets for the 2014 year is about 2.5% of the federal budget. And you could argue that both of the top line numbers had a little bit of wiggle room in them and negotiation room, so the actual difference, I would argue, between the two budgets, top line for 2014 is probably about one and a half percent. Given the challenges in the world, given the challenges in our economy, given the American public's desire to see us work together to find a compromise, and the upside that we can achieve if we do, I can't believe that one and a half percent difference in the top lines is an insuperable obstacle for us. We've got hard decisions to make. We need to make them with the interests of our own constituents, but the entire country in mind. 
and in particular in this world where every day you know we hear of a new potential challenge that could threaten our security if we don't deal with it in a smart way we need to get past the continuing resolutions and the and the gimmickry and the shutdowns and sequestration return to orderly budgeting and do the hard work of finding compromise again and with that uh, madam president i would yield uh, the floor back and i suggest the absence of a quorum the clerk will call the roll mr alexander Madam President. The Senator from Oregon. Madam President, I ask quorum call be lifted.